so I have the pleasure of being the first tutor or speaker or whatever. Um, so my name is Frédéric Ocher. I am from the Institute for Space Astrophysics in Orsay, south of Paris. Um, I am mostly a solar physicist, uh, working on data analysis quite a bit, and on the development of instrumentation with actually some of the people in the room here. <laughs> um, and I actually work quite a bit with Fourier analysis for what I'm doing professionally. And I guess that's why uh, David asked me to <laughs> talk about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so that's a very vast topic. Actually, I didn't know what to put as a, as a slide for the, my title slide. Uh, so that pi picture is, a, it's a, I guess it's a sick heart. Um, but Fourier analysis has a large variety of applications, and it's actually surprising that doctors don't use it to analyze these kind of signals. They still look at pieces of paper. Uh, but anyway. Um, so we, we, I think we've seen who you are. Um, so I looked, I don't know if that's representative of who is actually in the room, but I asked for the list of registered people to have an idea of uh, where to put the, the bar on the, you know, the level at which I was supposed to, to talk. Uh, so it seems from that Excel sheet that most of you are PhD students. So I don't know if that's still true in the room today, but I, I guess so. So who, are, who of you is a PhD student? Okay. And so who is masters? A few, and then postdocs, a few years postdocs, and so the others would be plus, 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 plus 10, plus, plus, plus. Okay. You guys are <laughs> not asking ages. Or <laughs> so I, I, w I aimed at PhD level. Um, although, if some of you already know, uh, Fourier analysis forward and backward, you may find interesting things, I hope, in there. Um, actually, when I started as a PhD student, I did, well, I, I did some Fourier analysis in the university, but usually you see only what's called the continuous Fourier transform of continuous signals, and you don't actually talk about Fourier transforms in terms of signals. It's a purely mathematical tool. Um, and the use of the Fourier transform in data analysis is quite a bit different. The, for, the Fourier transform that's used for actual discrete signals has very specific properties. And you usually don't learn about that in school. So did any of you had lectures on, on that topic, actually, in the university? Yes, a few? Only a few. So that's, I think that's representative. That's it's something that's barely touched upon in, uh, in the, the academic training. So I will require no prior knowledge of Fourier analysis, meaning that I will go over the very basics at the beginning. So don't fall asleep, because you may actually remember some things from your years as a student. Um, you may not. You may discover things that you should have seen, that you probably have seen at some point. But I think it's good to start from, the, from scratch, basically, because it's very basic. That will refresh your memory, and that's important to follow the rest of it. So, and then um, I'm old, so it will be mostly ideal for the hands-on sessions. Although I'm not asking you to know any of any ideal, so it's going to be mostly scripts that you can play with uh, to see, to illustrate some of the properties that I will show you today. So this is Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier. So Fourier analysis is something quite old, 1768, 1830. 
Um, and that's a quote from Fourier saying the, that's, I translated that. It's the in-depth study of nature is the most fecund source of discoveries in mathematics. Fourier developed Fourier transforms uh, to study the propagation of heat. And so that was really a mathematical tool to solve a physical problem. And that's what we are going to do today. And that's the transform of Fourier. So it's Fourier's transform. Uh, I'm not going to talk about 2D transforms. I'm going to talk only about one-dimensional problems. And, but that's fine, because everything can be generalized to n dimensions, two, three, four, whatever. Uh, and the same principles and properties apply to n dimensions. So just to make it simple, I will cover only 1D, 1D problems. So that's the outline of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to spend quite some time on that part because it's the, really the fundamentals that you need to master before you can actually do anything useful and meaningful with the Fourier transform in real life. So I'm going to go over the definitions and basic, basic properties, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the measurement process, the way you acquire data, and what's in the data that you should take into account when you, that you should keep in mind when you analyze data with Fourier analysis. Then I'm going to go slowly from the continuous transform of a continuous signal or function, which is what you see usually in school, and then go step by step uh, going through the, the discrete signal of a continuous function, the co discrete transform of a continuous function, sorry, the other way around, the continuous transform of a discrete function, and then the discrete transform of a discrete function, all the effects that go with it at each step what the, what, what's the effect of sampling, um, how to take into account all these effects and make sure that you understand their, the, all, all the possible uh, nasty side effects that, can, that they can have. I'm going to cover quickly the FFT as a tool that's not synonymous with Fourier transform. Uh, cover briefly the case of unevenly spaced data. I will pro treat mostly the case of evenly spaced data, but for many practical purposes, all of what I will present applies also to unevenly spaced data. Then I'm going to cover wavelet analysis, uh, and that's going to be based mostly on the use of that wavelet code. That's very, 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 very widespread in lots of fields from astrophysics to economics, and it's been used and abused. Um, and I'm here to save you from, <laughs> from Wavelet <laughs> and Fourier Sin. <laughs> it's, um, um, and I'm going to focus that uh, last part on the detection of periodic signals, because it's where you have to use statistics in Fourier analysis, and that's a topic that I work on. So you, I will show you what, what to do and not to do if you try to detect something periodic in a noisy signal. Um, so we're going to talk about the Fourier transform of noise, uh, the effects of detrending your time series, confidence levels, and how to use that code properly. It's a good code. You just have to use it right. Um, and the hands-on session will basically cover that, but the, the background, some of this, but the background, all that is needed to really understand that. So I, I expect you to actually follow really easily all that, and I will probably lose you somewhere there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you stop me, because, because I want you to understand that. But um, you can actually inter interrupt me at any time uh, if something is not clear. Uh, especially, I mean, anywhere, but at the beginning, if something is not clear, it's, it's important that you get the, the fundamentals straight. So, uh, well, I don't want to talk about the motivation, of, but just in two words, it's you find Fourier transforms everywhere. Uh, many problems can be narrowed down to computing Fourier transforms. Uh, even wavelet transforms, you compute them using Fourier transforms. Uh, 
So if you don't understand what's going on with the Fourier transform, it's, there is a good chance you're going to do something wrong with, Fourier, with wavelet analysis. Um, if you are working in optics, many optics problems can be solved quickly, computed efficiently using Fourier transforms. It's basically everywhere. So it's very often used as a black box, and if you don't understand what the black box is doing, well, you may run in tr into trouble. And in that case, well, that's simply the Fourier transform of the zebra. Uh, uh, I chose that picture because, of course, you have periodic-ish patterns, but in the Fourier transform, you can see uh, various features that will help you uh, quantify the picture of the zebra. For example, the, the small peaks that you see here, the enhancement in in power, that's not the Fourier transform, that's the square of the absolute value of the Fourier transform, that's the power spectrum. Um, so this peak would correspond to the mean frequency of the stripes and the orientation of that bar also is perpendicular to that uh, array of stripes. It's exactly the, the analogy in optics would be that, you know, multiple slits would diffract light perpendicular to the the orientation of the slits. Anyway, if you have to process that image directly, it's a real mess. In, in, in the Fourier space, it's way, way easier to do that because you can detect these features much more easily. Anyway, um, I, it shouldn't be hard to convince you that the, this, this is a very, very broad topic. I won't cover everything, of course, and, but it, it's just everywhere whether you, you notice it or not. Sometimes it's just in the back of what you're doing. So some references. Um, there are, I mean, you have countless textbooks on Fourier analysis. Um, so I can't really suggest one in particular. You will have various flavors and some you may prefer. But th that's a classic. Uh, so it's been uh, re-edited re n times with enlarge. Um, and I will actually focus my presentation on three papers. So this uh, that I recommend and that I put in the in what I give you. Maybe I should distribute these by. Do you have a way to distribute these by? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, I think it's, it's, it's a very good paper that will cover really the basics that you need to know about the effects and the, the basic properties of the Fourier transform in practice. So if you read that paper uh, from beginning to end and you understand it, then you will be aware of the main uh, issues that you have to uh, that you have to face when you do Fourier analysis with astronomical data, but any type of data. Uh, then I will use that as a guide for, for the wavelet analysis part. Um, that's also a very good paper, and I suggest that you actually read it uh, and not just use the code. <laughs> it's tempting to just use the code, but you should there should be a way so that you can access the code only if you went to the last section of the, <laughs> of the paper and actually understand what they say. Um, this is, I won't discuss that in detail, but that's also very good. Some of, many of the statistical aspects of the, the statistical properties of the Fourier spectra are described in, well, that, that's paper two, but there is one before from 81. Uh, that's very good. This, the introduction of, of that also is actually uh, very useful if you want to understand the basic statistics Oops, um, of Fourier transforms. It's just a selection. And then the last part on confidence levels, that will be a paper by my, myself, plus the erratum that goes with it, because there was a typo in the annex, uh, making the snippets of code unfunctional. But anyway, that's fixed. Um, so anyway, I will yeah, we'll focus on these three and use so that you can actually go back. Uh, I will use the figures from these papers. Uh, we use basically the same, the same structure. Uh, so you can go back and use that as a, as a reference. 
for what I will talk about. Uh, you, ha you have many, many others, of course, for specific aspects. Um, but, I mean, the literature on the topic is just uh, huge. So, um, let's, let's start with definitions. W when shall we break, actually? Maybe a, we have three hours, so um, maybe we could, can cut that. Okay. Okay, not before that, you think, uh, unless people fall asleep, but, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. That's okay, fine. Um, so there, there are the, the first difficulty is that you may find different notations in Fourier analysis for, or for the Fourier transform in general. There are many notations. Some are equivalent, some are not strictly equivalent because of normalizations. Uh, but um, I will suppose for the, the next slide that I consider a function S of t would be my signal, signal of variable that would be time, but that can be anything, of course. Uh, could be space or whatever dimension you are considering. So the Fourier transform is defined as this integral equation. So that's the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of that signal S of t times exponential to the minus 2i pi nu t, and nu being a frequency. A frequency being a true frequency, if your variable is time, uh, can be a, a generalized frequency, spatial frequency, or whatever frequ inverse of your input unit, um, if you're using any other type of unit. And you, de you define the inverse transform like so. The only difference, as you can see, being that minus sign here in the exponent. Um, there are, as I said, several other conventions. So the minus sign, for example, can be reversed. You can find that in some places. Uh, notations can be different. You can have this, uh, this notation. They are all equivalent, so that would be capital F of S or capital F of S of nu. Uh, F brackets, S of t, all that would be Fourier transforms. I will use mostly that one in the S hat in the next slides. Um, you can find it also defined in terms of the angular frequency, uh, two, 2 pi nu, so again, that's equivalent. You just have to be careful with the normalization. So one nice property is that you find back your original signal if you apply the inverse transform to the transform signal, and that's not necessarily the case if you don't use uh, the proper normalization. So you just have to be careful with that. So that these two transforms uh, introduce the concept of duality. So you will have various units, possible units, so time, length, whatever unit. And in the Fourier domain, you, so you will have inverse time, so that would be a frequency. And if you have a length, that would be the inverse length, or so wave number. Uh, whatever unit would be the inverse unit, and so if you input a, an inverse unit, you would get back your, your, other, your initial unit. So you really have this symmetry between the two domains, between the real domain and the Fourier domain. The two are really symmetrical in many ways, and we will see that uh, in the next slides. So, S of nu is a complex function, uh, and actually so is your signal in a way. So see that, you have duality between both. And you will see also that funny things happen if you consider discrete signals. And the th that your signal that you thought was just your signal is actually a periodic thing. Um, so you have this duality between the two domain, and you have to keep that in mind all the time. So we will call the norm of S hat the amplitude spectrum. The argument of that would be the phase, right? It's a complex number, so you have modulus and phase for each number. That's so far so good. The square of the amplitude will be the power spectrum. 
which is what I will plot mostly, because that's convenient, instead of plotting two, uh, the imaginary and the, com and the real part of a complex number each time. And it's very often what you're interested in, the power. Um, so of course, you can always express all this is, uh, I would say, implicit, but it's just good to state it. It's a, since it's a real function, you can express it as the sum of the real plus the imaginary parts. And you can also use, of course, the complex, uh, the, the exponential notation for complex numbers. Um, so basic properties of, so that's where the fun starts. Uh, so we start by the definition of the Fourier transform that you can decompose into the real, the sum of the real part plus the imaginary part. Okay, so it's just converting the exponential notation into the Cartesian notation with cosines and sines. So now if your signal is even, this, uh, this term here is zero, right? Uh, because sine is even and so is odd. And so in that case, that means that you have only this term left and therefore the Fourier transform is real and is even, right? So vice versa, if S is odd, then that term is zero there. And so the Fourier transform is purely imaginary and odd, okay? Now, if your signal uh, is real, which is the case most of the time, uh, unless you, compare, you, you consider pairs of values, which can be thought of as a, in some cases as a complex number, but most of most physical signals will be real signals. Um, so you can always express your function as the sum of an odd plus an even term which means that you can express your Fourier transform that way, and that term will be real and even, and that term will be purely imaginary and odd. Okay? That means that if your signal is real, so you, it will have this form, and the Fourier transform of your signal will be equal to the conjugate of the Fourier transform at minus the frequency, okay? So these are simply basic symmetric properties of the Fourier transform. Um, and we, you will see that all the time in, your, in the discrete Fourier transform that you will use. So you can remember these, these, pro these symmetric properties uh, basic properties of the Fourier transform. So one that is very nice uh, is that it's linear. So if you take the Fourier transform of A times F plus B times G, then the Fourier transform is A times the Fourier transform of F plus B times the Fourier transform of G. So that's good. Um, the time shifting, if you take a signal and you shift it in time or whatever uh, dimension that you are considering, the Fourier transform of it so you have the definition here, a simple change of variable uh, going from T to T prime gives you this, which means that the Fourier transform of your translated signal is simply the Fourier transform of the signal times this phase uh, term, okay? Easy. And you can do the, the opposite. So you start by a signal here that you multiply by this term. And so the Fourier transform of it would be this by definition, which is the Fourier transform of your signal but shifted in frequency. So you have, again, this symmetry between the time and the frequency domain. So if you shift in time, you simply get the Fourier transform of your signal times a phase term. And if you consider the Fourier, the Fourier transform shifted in frequency, well, you get back your signal times a modulation in time, okay? Um, time and frequency scaling. So if you consider a signal that's the 
that's a function of a times t. The Fourier transform of that will be by this by definition. Again, a simple change of variable will give you that, which means that you, the Fourier transform of a signal that comes from the multiplication of your time uh, variable by a constant is the Fourier transform of your signal at frequencies divided by that constant times that normalization factor. So if you, uh, if you have a dilation in time, it's a contraction in frequency and vice versa. So if you did optics, for example, you know that the frown of our diffraction is the Fourier transform of your input wavefront by whatever object is in the wavefront. For example, the diffraction pattern of a circular aperture, so typically a telescope, will be an array disk. That's, that's the Fourier transform of this circular aperture. Um, and if you squeeze your aperture, you will diffract more, and so your Fourier transform will be enlarged. Okay, so if you enlarge your aperture, as vice versa, you contract the, uh, the diffraction pattern due to that property. Okay? Um, so the time reversal property, so that's a spe special case of that. So if A is minus one, so the S of T is F of minus T, then your Fourier transform is the Fourier transform of F at frequency minus nu. That's again a symmetry pro property. And you also find that the Fourier transform of zero is simply the integral of your function. Okay, you just, that term goes to one. Um, and that's, that will be true for the discrete Fourier transform. The first term is simply the average of your signal. Um, Fourier transform of a derivative, that's uh, also good to know because you can see sometimes that people try to take the der derivative of signals before applying a Fourier transform to it. And so what that does, so you take the Fourier transform of a derivative of a derivative of our signal S. So this is uh, the definition of it. You can see that as express that as the limit of S of t plus delta t minus S of t on delta t, right? You can pull out the limit. So re-express that. This is the Fourier directly the Fourier transform of the signal. You, you can take this term out and so you are left with this. S can be taken out, so you're, you have this, and you end up with this expression, which means that the derivative, the Fourier transform of a derivative of a function is 2 i pi nu times the derivative of the function. So you don't do much by taking the derivative of your function, you, multi you basically multiply by nu. So in real life, if you apply a derivative to your signal, it's basically a very, it will be kind of a high pass filter in a way. You will enhance the small scale variations. And you will, the noise basically in your signal will explode because you multiply all the high frequencies by nu. We can see that later. And general, generally the nth derivative the Fourier transform of the nth derivative of S is 2 i pi nu to the power n times the, the Fourier transform of the initial signal. Okay? So far, it should not be a problem. Um, now, the convolution theorem. So that one is very important because you can use it in many situations to figure out what the Fourier transform of your expected signal is. If, for example, you are looking for uh, a specific uh, type of signal in noisy data, it's good to have an idea of, the, of what your signal should look like 
in the Fourier space. And in many cases, you can find analytic expressions. So you consider the convolution of two functions, n, f, and g. Take the Fourier transform of that. So this is the convolution product of the two functions, the inner bracket. Uh, take the Fourier transform of it, and that's the outer integral. So you can take f of tau out and compute the inner integral. You can reverse the order of integration because well, you have rules to, you are allowed to do that if one of the integrals converge. At least one of the integral converge. So since we assume that our functions are square integrable, it's always the case here. So you can apply that. Um, well, if the functions are not square integrable, you cannot compute a meaningful Fourier transform and especially meaningful power spectrum. So, um, and so you end up with this, which is simply the Fourier transform, sorry, the product of the Fourier transforms of the individual functions, f and g, okay? So it's something that you should remember. The Fourier transform of the convolution product of two functions is the product of the Fourier transforms of the two functions, okay? And vice versa, the Fourier transform of the product of two functions is the convolution product of the Fourier transform of each function, right? So again, you have this symmetry between the two spaces, okay? Uh, whether if it's f hat or f, it doesn't really matter. If in one space you are multiplying, in the other space you are convolving. And if, one, if in one space you are convolving, in the other space you are multiplying. Um, so the Fourier transform translates between multiplication and convolution, and that's very, very convenient because many, in many problems you have to compute convolutions, and that's very efficiently computed in the Fourier space. Simply go to the Fourier space, and, you, and the convolution product, which is kind of a nasty thing to compute, uh, is simply the product of two functions in the Fourier space. And since Fourier transforms can be computed very efficiently, uh, in, very, in many cases you can gain a lot of time by computing convolutions in the Fourier space. So in combination with the linearity and time shifting properties, so the ba basic, basic properties, uh, the convolu convolution theorem can be used to derive the Fourier transform of many usual signals. Uh, and we will see that. So one other, one, another important theorem is Parseval's theorem, which is the following. So we assume that our signal is real and that it can be expressed as the product of two functions, well, as the square, sorry, of a function. So it's f times f. So you take the Fourier transform of that. So the Fourier transform of f squared is that. From the convolution th theorem, it's simply the convolution of the Fourier transforms of the two functions f and f. So it's the autoconvolution of, of this function f. And you can re-express this, re this as a convolution product. Okay. Now, if, if you take nu equals zero, you end up with this. So the integral from minus infinity to plus inf infinity of f squared is equal to the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of nu hat times f of minus sigma hat integral over, sig over sigma which means that the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the square of your function is, equ is equal to the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the power spectrum of the Fourier transform of your function. That means in physical terms that energy is conserved between the two spaces. Uh, so the average power in your signal will be equal to the average power in the transform in terms of signal processing, that will be that will that's equivalent to saying that this, the variance in your signal is equal to the mean power in your signal in the in its Fourier transform. Um, 
And that's, uh, that will be, I'll say more on this later, but keep this in mind. We will use that for normalization purposes. Okay, does that make sense? You've seen that, I guess, at some point, yes? Um, and you have equivalent theorems for wavelets. Uh, basically the same thing over an extra dimension. Um, okay. So I'll just go over on the Fourier transform of a few common functions slash distributions that we sometimes consider as functions or if we are doing nasty mathematics. Uh, you can find many of them of the generic, of the transform for common functions on the Fourier transform Wikipedia page um, or whatever textbook you prefer. So one that's very useful is the Dirac delta function because that will be used to model sampling at a given point. Okay, you multiply a signal by a Dirac delta function and you will sample at the position of that delta. So the Fourier transform of uh, a Dirac delta will be this by definition, and that's equal to one in shorthand notation, so, so that would be a, a unit distribution, so one everywhere. Um, now if, you, if the Fourier transform that you're considering is a delta function, so if you have a single peak in a Fourier transform, that means that your signal is, I don't know why I put a one here, is, is vice versa, is one everywhere. Okay, it's just this duality thing again. It's symmetric. Um, so if, and so if your, if your signal is one everywhere, then the transform is, is a direct center on zero. So from the time shifting theorem, if your Dirac is centered on T and not on zero, the Fourier transform will be this and you will have only left that phase term that you had a couple of slides ago in the, there, right, right, it's that thing. So again, vice versa, if you have a Dirac on frequency, whatever, capital nu, uh, your signal will be this. Next is, uh, where did I want to come with that? Yes, so. was the difference for I was where was I going with this so that's the same thing so from from these properties from the properties of the Fourier transform of, of Dirac delta functions you can derive the Fourier transform of a pure cosine or a pure sine so you can show that the Fourier, if your signal is this cosine, then the Fourier transform of it is the sum of two delta functions, one centered on nu zero, which is the frequency of my cosine, and one centered on minus nu zero. And if your signal is a sine, then the only difference will be a a phase, but you will also have an imaginary i here, okay? So if, you, if your signal is a pure cosine, your Fourier transform is a Dirac. For, well, the sum of two Dirac's. And usually you keep only one because this is, is, this, this is redundant, okay? This is, they are simply symmetric, one from another with respect to the origin. That's why we are looking for peaks in the Fourier power spectra uh, when we are looking for periodic signals, right? Because the transform of the cosine is the sum of two Dirac's. 
so two discrete peaks. So one very important function that appears everywhere, um, whether you like it or not, is that. So uh, a, the square function that goes, that's zero everywhere except between minus t on two and plus t on two. And that appears everywhere because it's basically, it basically defines or it can be used to model the finite interval that you are sampling. You, you're never, never taking infinitely long signals. You're, all, you're always considering finite signals from T1 to T2 or whatever, or you're considering an image in a limited field of view. And basically that function uh, appears naturally from, uh, from that. So you can consider that you have an infinite signal and that you are just cropping it using that function. So the Fourier transform of that is the integral from minus t over 2 to plus t over 2 of exponential minus 2 i pi nu t over t, uh, which is equal to this, which boils down to this expression. So the Fourier transform of this uh, door function here is sine pi nu t over pi nu t, which is sometimes known as the sink function, which looks like this. Okay, so it has a peak on zero and then side lobes and zeros every one over t. Okay. So the, the analogy with optics would be, that would be the, the airy disk that you get when you compute the Fourier transform of an aperture. So if you have, a, in 1D, if you have a spectrometer with a slit, the Fourier transform of the slit will be, will give you this, and uh, the modulus squared of that will give you the, the PSF of your instruments, basically. Um, so one Fourier transform that you should also have in mind, because it's, it's, it's one of the easy ones, is the Fourier transform of a Gaussian function. And you can demonstrate easily, I won't go over the various steps, but the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So that's, that's nice. Um, and that's very often convenient because you can model many things and Gaussians appear in many cases naturally. So it's, it's good to know that, but you, you can, I don't know, yeah, well, that's, you can have, you have analytic expressions for many, many uh, usual functions. And these are the most useful. The, the, the square function because it appears due to the uh, finite duration of your data. The Dirac function because it, re, it will represent the sampling of your data. You're never, you're never using continuous signals. You're always using discrete signals. And so these will appear all the time, which is why I mentioned that here. But if you are interested in a specific signal shape, you, it's advised that you try to compute the analytic form of the Fourier transform of the signal that you're looking at or that you're looking for. Um, because you may compute Fourier transforms and you will see various spectral shapes and you don't necessarily know whether that's what that corresponds to, whether uh, if you're looking, for example, for periods, whether a peak that has a given width is physical or if that makes sense, you should try to either, for one way or the other, if you have a, a spectrum in Fourier space, try to go back to the measurement domain and see what that corresponds to. Uh, if you see a Gaussian in your Fourier spectrum, you know that it's, must be a, there must be a Gaussian somewhere in, in the measurement domain. Uh, if you see... 
uh, damped oscillations in your signal, you know that has a computable signature in the Fourier spectrum. And you should try to compute that and see if you expect the right properties. Because it's in, in many cases, it's feasible to compute analytic solutions. So that's one example. <laughs> don't, uh, I don't expect that you uh, remember this. But if you have, for example, this type of signal, which is actually pretty complex, that's, period, that's a periodic signal. But it's, in a way, it's random. The amplitude of these peaks are random. So it's a signal that's formed by a, by a sequence of pulses that are repeated every capital T with random amplitudes. OK? Um, it turns out that you can compute what's the power spectrum of that. So even if you have random variables in there, you can compute the ex at least the mean, so the expected power uh, in your signal. So that's, that's an example. So you can actually compute in, in the case of this type of signal that the expected power is the, the, the power spectrum that you expect from a single pulse times this expression, which is m times sigma, sigma being the um, standard deviation of the distribution of amplitudes plus mu being the uh, mean of your distribution of amplitudes times that sinc function squared. And the, and the result is something that looks like this. So the, the Fourier transform of that basic pulse is, is this, and the, the various peaks here correspond to that term. That, that was computed for a very specific application, but it's actually something that's very, very common everywhere and probably in your cell phones because it's, it's something that's basically encoded in many uh, uh, demodulators. Because signals that are periodic and random is basically what you expect in telecoms. Series of bits that are ones and zeros. Well, you're not necessarily transmitting noise, but on average, you have as many zeros as ones, and they, come in, and they can come in more or less random order. And anyway, the distribution of zeros and ones will have a sigma and a mu, a mean and a, and a variance. And, you, and that's the expected power for this type of signals. So you, you find these results in classical handbooks of telecommunications. It's been derived in the 50s uh, when uh, signal processing and and information theory exploded. I don't expect you to remember this, and there is no point in remembering it. It's just to show you that in many, many cases, you can actually compute the actual analytic expression of the signal that you are considering, even if the signal is pretty complex. And it's very useful, because if you have an analytic expression, then you can do many things that you cannot do uh, with, uh, with a numerical estimate. Anyway, yes, yes. Well, it's just a, f a fluctuation. You, fall, you, you can have var various realization of, the, of that sequence. That's just one for random amplitudes. So the next, for next, another run, you will have different amplitudes. And in the background, you have just one realization of the Fourier spectrum. And the, the, the thick lines are, the, are, are the, the average, the mean, or the expected in terms of statistics. Yes, yes. That's what you expect on average. So you, you cannot compute what you expect. Well, you can, but it's, it's a bit useless. You can compute what you expect, what the, the correct result for one. But you can also compute statistically, on average, what you expect. Uh, so the blue, that's just an example. So the blue ones are Gaussians. Uh, these ones are actually almost double exponentials. They are kappa functions, but this one is symmetric, but you can have, you can have it, it doesn't matter. You can have non-symmetrical peaks. As long as a single pulse has a 
an analytic form, then you can compute this. And this function is the product of that times these periodic peaks. So the, the P here is this continuous background. But anyway, the point here is that you should take the pain to compute the, whenever possible, the analytic expression of the signal you are considering, or to try to, it's very often useful to simplify your signal or to model it in terms of basic functions or, or the, um, the, the combination of several functions uh, using eventually the convolution product or the time shifting theorem to, to decompose the signal you're considering into smaller elements and compute the expected, the expected uh, Fourier transform. Okay, so far any questions for the basic reminders? All right, so um, a, few, a few words on measurements. So physical measurements are usually uh, a sample of a signal that's, that you can consider it, uh, that you can consider as an underlying infinite signal, continuous. But in fact, you are only using a sample that's di discrete and finite in space or time or whatever uh, dimension you are considering. Okay? So that can, be, that can be a light curve between T1 and T2 every delta T uh, that you are measuring. So if you are doing a photometry of stars, it could be spectrum of a star between lambda 1 and lambda 2 every delta lambda can be an image at a given, within a given field of view with a, a, an angular sampling uh, on theta and phi, uh, etc. Um, your signal usually has intrinsic cutoff frequencies, meaning that you don't have, usually, in the signal itself, frequencies larger than a given frequency SD, and here I'm using the notations of the bro and white paper that I showed at the beginning. Um, so that's due to the fact that you will, in a physical signal, you will have um, characteristic times. That can be, for example, a cooling time. Say you don't have anything that goes faster than a cooling time or a propagation time or whatever. Okay, so you in, if, you, if you're considering time, in many cases, you will have a limit somewhere in your signal, a physical limit. Um, your measurement apparatus introduces noise, always, and thus uh, frequencies that are potentially higher than the intrinsic frequencies of your signal. Potenti it's, you may also have very high frequencies in your signal, but it's it's very often the case. If you have a smooth, for example, spectral line, uh, your measurement uh, chain will usually introduce noise that has higher frequencies than the width of your spectral line, like red noise, for example, from a camera. Um, the apparatus itself very often has intrinsic cutoff frequencies. Uh, due to also, again, the finite response times in, in an instrument. So that can also be caused by the finite integration time that you are using. So you don't have anything that goes faster than your integration time. That can be your spatial or spectral resolution. You don't have anything smaller than your array disk, let's say. So, um, here I'm using uh, copies of the images that, yes? I will come to that later, yes, yes. I'm not considering gaps now, but I will 
okay, that will introduce frequencies. You can see a gap as, as applying a window to your signal. So you'll always apply the square window because you have a beginning and an end. But then if you have a gap in between, that would be a more complex window. But you can easily compute the effect of that because it's two, you can see that as the sum of two separate windows and you know the Fourier transform of, of one is a sync function. And so you can use, again, the convolution and time shifting theorems to easily compute the Fourier transform of your two windows if you have a big gap. So any, any number of windows can be decomposed into the sum or the, of n windows and that are shifted in time. And so you, you can com easily compute what, what is the effect of gaps. Um, so, yes, so these images are taken from Bro and White. So every, in, in these type of plots, what's plotted is the Fourier power. Uh, so very often I will say plot the Fourier transform, but it's usually the power spectrum. Um, and they con what they consider as an example is a spectrum of the sun somewhere in the visible. So you have kind of a continuous and absorption lines. Okay? But that could be anything. I mean, the, the argument is generic. It's just an, a, an example for an, an illustration. Um, so we assume a continuous signal. That's, for example, the spectrum of a star. So in that case, the sun. And, and that's its transform. So the transform always appears noisy. And you can see that also in the, for example, in the Fourier transform of Fourier or the Fourier transform of the zebra in 2D. It looks like full of speckles. That's because you need uh, lots of frequencies and interferences, so to speak, between these frequencies to recreate the structures in your signal. So it's, it's, it always has this noisy aspect. Um, so the transform is symmetrical about the origin. So we'll see that, we'll see that later. Um, the transform is, is well, in a well-designed measurement. Uh, system, the, the transform will be zero above, above some frequency. And if you're considering the pure signal, so the underlying signal, the Fourier transform is indeed zero above the cutoff frequency because by definition, there is nothing, there is no information that has a frequency higher than the, for example, the cooling time of your uh, physical system. So in, if you're experiment is well designed, the cutoff frequency of your noise should be higher than this because your apparatus should not remove frequencies from, your, from the signal you want to measure. If your apparatus filters some of these frequencies in that range, it means you're, you're removing information, so that's, that would be bad. But the noise expands the range of frequencies over which the transform is non-zero. Okay, so you, 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 noise is a, generally noise adds power at all frequencies um, and, at, and, and at higher frequencies than the, than the signal itself. And SC here would be the cutoff frequency of your measurement system. Um, so that's what you have, okay, so that's the, again, that's the, the pure underlying signal here, and you're considering one segment of that, so from here to there, you take the trans Fourier transform of that, no power above the cutoff here, and you add noise, so that's, that would be your true signal, and the Fourier transform of it has this, uh, this flat tail that's usually called white noise by definition because it has constant power uh, as a function of frequency. So then, 
let's consider the discrete signal. The, yes, the discrete signal and its transform. So the continuous transform of the discrete signal. So here we consider the continuous signal and, the conti and that's what is represented is the continuous transform. So the nice mathematical expression that we've all seen in school at some point, right, with integrals. So now we sample the signal. So I will, I will consider a regular sampling and I will say a few words about irregular sampling later. But for now, let's consider regular sampling. So we, simple, we sample our data at, with one value every delta t, or one value every whatever for an image, delta theta, del, delta phi, or you sample your signal. And the sample signal can be expressed as so. So that your sample signal is your continuous signal times a Dirac comb of period delta x or delta t or delta whatever, okay? So if you're not familiar with that letter, that's the Sha Cyrillic letter that represents a dir hmm? Okay. So that's the Sha Cyrillic letter that represents a Dirac comb. You have only three uh, teeth, but you are supposed to have an infinity, okay? That's one Dirac delta function every, every delta x. So the continuous of the transform of the signal is thus this, right? Because you multiply your signal by a Dirac every delta x, you get rid of that integral, and that integral gets replaced by this sum, okay? So n is here the number of samples, uh, your signal is sampled at xj, okay? So this is the continuous transform of a discrete signal. I did not discretize yet the frequency, okay? Frequency is continuous. I can compute the transform at any frequency I want. It's only my signal that's been discretized. So one consequence of sampling is that it produces a replication of the transform every delta nu equals one over delta, delta x. Why is that so? Uh, you can derive that easily from the convolution theorem. So we have the Fourier transform of that Dirac comb of period A is another Dirac comb of period one over A and the Fourier transform of the product of two functions is the convolution product of the Fourier transform of the functions. Therefore, uh, the Fourier transform of my sample signal is the Fourier transform of the continuous signal convolved by the Fourier transform of my, di of my Dirac comb, meaning that it's the Fourier transform of my continuous signal convolved by a Dirac comb of period one over delta x. And that's a periodic signal. Because if I convolve my Fourier transform by this, it means that I make basically one copy of my Fourier transform centered on each peak of the Dirac comb, okay? So by simply taking discrete samples, you created a periodic Fourier transform. It was not periodic before. It became periodic because of the sampling. So one replica, also called an alias, so you've always, you've very often heard the term aliasing. An alias is one copy of a Fourier transform. And it's copied and centered on each one of these Dirac delta functions of the Dirac comb. That's a, the Fourier transform of the Dirac comb that represents your sampling. Another way to see that, it's, that the Fourier transform is periodic is to realize that this is nothing but the expression of a Fourier series. And Fourier series represent period, periodic functions. Okay? So that can only be a, a periodic function. 
that's a bit of a circular argument, but so that's that's the right way to demonstrate that. So that's what we have. You have your signal that's discretized. And now your Fourier transform looks like this. It's periodic because you convolved this by a Dirac comb, so one Dirac here, one here, one here, one here, okay? And you center one transform on each Dirac comb. So what happens is that if your sampling is too coarse, then your transform will overlap, okay? Why can, will they overlap? Because the Fourier transform of your Dirac comb of period A is a Dirac comb of period one over A, and so if one over A is smaller than the maximum frequency contained in your signal, the, the tails of, four, of your Fourier transforms will overlap. And in that case, the signal is said to be aliased. And that's bad, because you're losing information. So the frequency in between two replicas is called the Nyquist frequency. So it's basically uh, one over two delta x. That's the midway point. And so that leads us to this sampling theorem, which says that one over delta x must be greater or equal to twice the maximum frequency contained in the signal. Okay, if it's not the case, and the replicas or the aliases of the Fourier transform will overlap and you will lose signal. But if you verify that condition, then the discrete samples contain all the information contained in the continuous signal. So if you sample properly, you will, you will be able to recover all the information in your underlying signal from only the sampled points. Okay? So that's, that's what alias, aliasing means. Um, so aliasing is back. It's, you cannot get rid of it like this. The, so the noise is generally, generally broadband. Um, so you can, it's sometimes very hard to sample quickly enough to have a non-aliased signal. So if possible, you can actually, you should actually low pass your, your signal. And that's okay because it's only noise in that region. But it's hard to escape photon noise, to escape to photon noise. I mean, like if you are considering photons, it's very, 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 very broadband. And you will have some aliasing somewhere. Plus, in any case, the measurements are finite in time or space or whatever. They are just finite. So you don't consider that sampled signal. You're considering that signal, but chopped here at zero and then chopped at the end. Okay? So you actually multiply that sampled signal by a step, well, a door function, a square function. Okay? So you don't only multiply it by a Dirac function, you also multiply by by a square function. So that, so you represent that by the multiplication of your signal by your rectangular function that I uh, write pi of x. And that produces high frequencies due to the discontinuity between the beginning and the end of the measurement. Which means that the transform can be aliased even if you sample your signal correctly. Um, so why do I have, yes, so that's more, more on this. So because the measurement is finite, the transform is convolved by a sync function. So again, the convolution theorem, you multiply your signal by a square function. So in Fourier, it means that you convolve, so that's, here are the multiplication in the measurement space. In Fourier, you convolve the Fourier transform of your signal by the Fourier transform of the square function. Okay? Which means that you replace, so the 
convolving would mean that you replace each value here by the sync function with the appropriate scaling, which means that you will have leakage of power from the low frequencies to the higher frequencies, and you will, you will basically fill in that gap here. Okay, where you had zero power, you will have some power because you convolve that by the, th the sync function. Okay? So you can deal with that, uh, but that also means that the practical transform it can never be identical to the transform of the underlying signal, even if in the limit of a continuous signal, because you're measurement window is finite. So what you're evaluating is only a proxy for the underlying real transform of your signal. Um, so, but once you know that, it's okay because you can, you can deal with it. And at least you're aware of it and you know what can be the side effects. So the the thing also is that the longer the observing time, the higher the frequency resolution, and that will help also in many cases because your resolution is one over n delta x, so the, 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 the separation between two frequency bins here will be one over n delta x. And if you have a higher, resolution, higher frequency resolutions, it will be usually beneficial. So that's the end of aliasing. Um, that's another way to look at it. The transform as frequency nu is contaminated by frequencies uh, above the Nyqu Nyquist frequency. So these are various sign components at increasing frequencies. Okay, and when you reach the Nyquist frequency, so that you the, the plots go to increasing frequencies here and there, and then it continues like so. And so if you increase the frequency again, you will end up with exactly the same, the same components. They will look exactly the same above the Nyquist frequency. Um, you can see that if you, if you draw a sine curve and you sample it uh, less and less. So you, you put a lot of points along your curve, and then you, you end up at a, at a given point, you will have only points at the minima and maxima, and then you will have less, okay? You will have less points than, less than two by period. And if you join the points, you will see that what you get is this, and then this, and this, and this, and this, as the sampling rate decreases. So that, so you can you can do it on a piece of paper and you will see that you will just you just see it that means that the five right hand side components can be this, this can't be distinguished from that in the left uh, it means that you cannot solve the problem by calculating the transform at frequencies higher than Nyquist don't try it there is no additional information and there is no additional information and there is no additional information don't do it yeah, there is nothing to gain by computing at frequencies higher than Nyquist. You will end up with this. You will end up with exactly the same information, simply because the transform is periodic. So if you go to higher frequencies, you will find, oop, you will find the same things over and over and over again. There is absolutely nothing to compute uh, that's meaningful above Nyquist. Oops. Um, so now the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, for now, we've considered only the finite transform of, yeah, if I, maybe I should finish with that and then it would make for a meaningful break. Um, I've considered only con the continuous transform of a discrete signal. All we've done is to take the signal, multiply it by a Dirac uh, comb to sample the data, and multiply it by a square function to represent the fact that the data is finite. So now I can discretize my frequencies, and that's usually what you do. And it's actually meaningful because 
since you have only n points in your data, you can show uh, in information theory that it's only meaningful to compute n frequencies, or well, n over two frequencies. And we've seen that the one way to see that is that the frequency resolution is one over n delta x. That's the that's what we've just seen before, and thus we evaluate the transform as at, at these n discrete frequencies separated by one over n delta x. And that's the discrete Fourier transform. So here, the frequencies are discretized. And you have the inverse transform uh, defined that way. Um, and that's what will be coded in your favorite programming language, uh, modulo a few normalization factors that you should be aware of, and sh you should be careful um, when you use Fourier transforms, because not all programming languages use the same conventions. And so you may scratch your head trying to figure out why the power that you compute is not so what the analytic expression says it should be. Uh, so you sh should, usually there is a one over n here or one over n here, but it depends where they put it. it it's okay as long as, uh, as long as you know where it is. Um, but in any, any case, just, just look at the documentation, it's written somewhere. Um, so what happens when you discretize the Fourier transform? So the transform of a discrete signal is periodic, so we've seen that, but vice versa, it means that the underlying signal itself is periodic because you sample at in frequency. Okay, again, it's this duality thing. Because you discretize in frequency, in fact, the, Fourier, the discrete Fourier transform considers that your signal is one period of an infinitely long <laughs> periodic signal. And we will see that in practice in the, in the hands-on. So you can actually consider that your signal is, so if your signal is this, actually what the Fourier transform considers, so to speak, is that it's below it or behind it, you have this. You have an infinite number of repetitions of your chunk of data. Um, so the symmetry properties, quickly, we've seen that. So the n measure values are real, usually. So the transform is, if com is composed of n complex values. So there is symmetry with respect to the origin and Nyquist. So this is the frequency axis. So you have to bend your brain a little bit. That's the real axis and the imaginary axis there. So we've seen the symmetry property before, so it's going to be um, even on the real axis with symmetry around Nyquist. And the imaginary part is going to be odd with symmetry about Nyquist and the origin. Okay? Uh, the imaginary part of the coefficients at the origin n at Nyquist is zero. Okay, that's normal. And there are n independent Fourier coefficients as there are n input numbers. So you have n over two plus one real values, independent values, and n over two minus one imaginary values. Um, I can stop here, I guess. We can break. Okay. So we have a half an hour break. Um, so please, yeah, come to me if anything was not clear, or if you have questions. Or. <laughs>